in 1919, looking over fight contracts signed by Jess Willard and challenger Jack Dempsey. On field near Toledo, he'll build Wooden Stadium to house coming fight for World's Heavyweight Boxing Championship. Former cowpuncher, Rickard quit Texas to join writer Rex Beach in fruitless search for Klondike gold. But here's a gold mine all his own. And here's one of two reasons crowds will jam Rickard's Toledo Stadium. It's giant Jess Willard in heavy sweater. Sure, he'll dump Dempsey in early round and retain his heavyweight crown. Jess is off to training camp where he looks like killer and in perfect condition for his July date with a strong but youthful kid from Manassa, Colorado. Determined to do his best on Independence Day, Dempsey plans to add win over Willard to his victory string. $60 top is high for times, but it's fight spectators could never forget. Dempsey knocks Willard down seven times in first round, and Willard was so battered by the end of third, his seconds threw in the towel. With Dempsey as his new attraction, Rickard draws million dollar gate to New Jersey area for Jack's fight with Carpentier of France. Jack wins, and Rickard goes on to new and greater glories at old Madison Square Garden on 23rd Street in New York City. Missouri-born Tex is long way from gold fields now, but silver tinkling at turnstiles is making him rich. But he's earning it by bringing good boxers into ring. The newsreel selection we just saw places the heavyweight title bout between Jack Dempsey and George Carpentier in Jersey City, July 2nd, 1921, as a pivotal moment in the career of Tex Rickard. Promoter Rickard's biography reads like a historical novel of America, from his youth as a rancher in Texas to running casinos in the gold rush of Alaska and in Reno, and back to ranching in Argentina. The fight that he built, not for the first time, as the battle of the century made history as the first million dollar gate in professional boxing and also provided a public spectacle highlighting Jersey City at a moment of triumph in the early career of long-serving mayor and political boss Frank Haig, just beginning his second of seven and a half terms as mayor. As much as the mayor and promoter seem larger than life, so too the boxers played iconic roles. Dempsey came up hard in the American West, learning to brawl and bar and box cars as much as in the ring, versus the Frenchman Carpentier with an elegant polish and a heroic turn serving as an airman in the Great War. With Dempsey still carrying some stain of accusations of dodging service, thrown out of court but still in the public mind, the complex theater that would increasingly come to enhance the sport was coming into play as this bout became what author Jim Walzer has called the birth of modern promotion. The bout would also mark an important development in the history of the new medium of radio, being broadcast live across the airwaves through a relay of amateur radio operators who brought the signal to be heard through loudspeakers at concert halls and meeting places, since home sets were still quite rare. Sports would continue to play an important role in the emerging mass culture of broadcast media consumption. The fight has received a lot of attention over the years, so today as we mark the centennial of the event, rather than review the story told well elsewhere, we'll spend some time with a few primary source documents. A special fight edition of the Jersey Journal, a historic map to help give a precise location of the fight arena, and an August 1921 edition of Wireless Age, in which the story of the historic broadcast is told. On April 15th, the Jersey Journal announced that the fight would be held at Boyle's 30 Acres. But where exactly was Boyle's 30 Acres? John F. Boyle owned a box factory and straw board manufactory at Montgomery Street and also owned property on the south side of Montgomery Park, or Montgomery Oval as it was sometimes known. He was also 
not coincidentally, an early political backer of Mayor Frank Haig, and also treasurer of New Jersey's Democratic Campaign Committee. Haig put Boyle in touch with Rickard, and Rickard took a look at the property. The journal reports that, standing in the center of the tract, Dex Rickard said, I like this. You can't beat this site. It has the advantages of quick transportation. It's easy to get to from tubes and trains and trolleys. The journal article describes Boyle's 30 acres as just south of Montgomery Oval. A Chamber of Commerce flyer included an aerial photograph of the area showing the arena that had been constructed in the lower left-hand corner of the image. The image is fairly grainy when blown up and, and hard to read precisely, although it does give some sense of the size of the arena. Now we do see the bend in Grand Street and the line of the National Docks Railroad going across. A map included in the same Chamber of Commerce flyer shows the arena within local landmarks. But the best way we have to get a precise location of the arena comes from using historic Sanborn atlases. Sanborn atlases were provided primarily for insurance companies, but they are very useful for local history. Instead of reprinting the expensive large volumes every year, it was more cost-effective to have employees of the company go around to their customers and paste in changes that had happened over the years. So a map that originally was printed around 1910 would have layers and layers of paste over. For the ones that we have access to, updated up to around 1950, you can see several layers of history literally inscribed on the map. And in some cases, where there haven't been a lot of changes, you can still see traces of earlier construction underneath the pastings. And that fortunately is the case with text records of Rena, because we can see faint traces of it in this 1952 Sanborn Atlas, and if we use some editing tools to bump up the contrast, we can really see the text appear. The Boxing Arena Text Record Proprietor. And we can see the shape of the arena uh, under the brick structure that is there in the 1950s. Now we can use another tool uh, called Map Warper to lay that historic map on top of a current map. And then using a slider, we can go back and forth, comparing the historic map to the current map. And we can really see that the, the center of the ring is at a warehouse building, a building to the, uh, across the street from Booker T. Houses. Centered in a large rectangular building. Now, if we go to a current view, uh, we can either walk down the street or, since we are on the computer, we can use Google Earth to see if it's a large warehouse building, trucks parked outside. And if we go to Google Street View, we can see that it's a warehouse of Jake's Cartage Company. You have to wonder if the folks working at Jake's Cartage know that one end of their building is the site of the boxing ring where Dempsey met Carpentier in 1921. The special fight issue of the Jersey Journal, a 14-page insert included with the paper of the day of the fight, is worth a close look for what it reveals about Jersey City 100 years ago. The special section, like the bout itself, bears the marks of the city government under the leadership of Frank Haig in collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce. While the journal's relationship with the mayor would have many ups and downs over the following years, 1921 marked a point where Haig had solidified his political primacy as a man of the people, political reformer, and champion of law and order. While certain types of vice were targeted by Haig, as a former boxer and manager himself, he was open to the opportunity to bring the boxing business to Jersey City. This bout would be a return to Jersey City for Carpentier, who had won the light heavyweight title here in 1920. 
The title page of the issue features the faces of the fighters hovering over the then new journal building at Journal Square above a portrait gallery of the recently elected and re-elected commissioners, welcoming fight fans to the city. The second page celebrates the physical accomplishment of the arena's construction in two half-page ads, one from the Jersey City construction firm and one from the NYC vendor who had supplied two and a half million feet of lumber. The next page touts the efficient public transportation access to the city provided by the Hudson and Manhattan Railroad, precursor to today's path. And it's interesting to note that the ad makes a point of crediting the municipal government. Haig had first made his mark as a public safety commissioner by reforming and professionalizing the police force, and in fact creating a special unit of enforcers for his own personal purposes. The public safety aspect is highlighted next in the special edition, no doubt to rebut any criticism that boxing fans are an unseemly element. This was also a signature record move. The promoter always promised that society women would attend and feel safe at his events. A sidebar on the legalization of boxing in New Jersey provides a contrast to the then current state of affairs in New York. In fact, if a Republican governor had not unseated the more amenable Al Smith in 1920, the fight may well have taken place in Ebbets Field. Half-page ads from Union Terminal Market and Muller's Pasta highlight Jersey City entering a high point in its industrial and transportation history, as do large ads on the following pages. Jersey City as a site of grand houses and apartments is highlighted next. The Hudson County Courthouse, now named for William J. Brennan, is highlighted as an architectural jewel in the crown. George Carpentier had a successful sideline as a writer about sports and exercise, and here is cited giving exercise tips for women, again part of softening and broadening the appeal of boxing. A full-page ad from the commissioners spells out all of the highlights of the city, ending with the short-lived tagline slogan, next to the largest city in the world. A two-page spread reproduces the map created for the Chamber of Commerce for its own flyer. The map highlights train, auto, and ferry access to the city from the immediate region, emphasizing Jersey City's connectivity, as well as the activity of the Chamber. The section closes with a full-page ad from the Trust Company of New Jersey, a long-standing Jersey City business with its origins in the 19th century era when Jersey City served as a center for business incorporation, much like the state of Delaware would come to serve on a national level. A PDF of this special edition, as well as the wireless age article that we will discuss next, is available from the Jersey City Public Library. Just email us at njroom at jclibrary.org. We'll be happy to send you a copy of those two documents. Today we are so immersed in a vast array of communications technology, carrying sound and images across time and space, that it is difficult to imagine that within the lifetime of the oldest people alive today, radio was a new development and broadcasting was in its infancy. The telegraph and then the telephone had done much to allow news to travel instantaneously in 19th century, but the idea of hearing a voice recounting events from miles away in real time for a large audience was a new one in 1921, and the dempsey Carpentier fight was the occasion for an early experiment in radio broadcasting. An account of this grand experiment was published the month after the fight in Wireless Age. In 1919, under pressure from the U.S. government, the Marconi Corporation had sold its American operations to General Electric, which formed a new subsidiary, the Radio Corporation of America, RCA. The trade journal Marconigram was renamed Wireless Age. Imagery here is all drawn from the August 1921 account. But additional context from my description is drawn from a January 2000 article by Thomas H. White. Perhaps inspired by reports of a fight broadcast to a limited audience in Pittsburgh, 
Julius Hopp, manager of Madison Square Garden Concerts, brought the idea of broadcasting the Jersey City fight to a regional audience to Tex Rickard, then president of Madison Square Garden. Ever aware of the value of publicity, Rickard agreed, leaving the details to Hopp. Hopp reached out to amateur radio organizations, which at that time was the majority of radio technology workers, and found a collaborator in J. Andrew White of the National Amateur Wireless Association, who was also the editor of Wireless Age. And through the Wireless Age connection, financial and engineering support from RCA was provided by way of General Manager David Sarnoff. A Navy-built transmitter was secured for use, and after the idea of placing the transmitter at ringside was rejected, it was brought from Schenectady to the Lackawanna Terminal in Hoboken, connected to ringside by a specially laid telephone wire. A nearby test tower would serve as the other anchor for a huge broadcast antenna stretching out from the terminal's tower. J. Andrew White, seated at ringside, would report on the fight. At the last minute, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, as part of a complex series of negotiations with RCA, opposed the direct connection of their line to the transmitter and Early accounts, such as the Wireless Age article, say that Owen Smith, the engineer at the terminal, read relayed accounts provided by White. But many years later, Ed White admitted that they had in fact done an end run around these restrictions by essentially placing a microphone up to a phone receiver at the terminal. Uh, so it was in fact White's voice that went out over the radio. This accounts for contemporary reports of the radio audience hearing the ringside gong and crowd noise. Since home radios were very rare at the time, a network of theaters and halls was set up where local amateurs would operate receivers hooked up to loudspeakers to hear the broadcast. Funds raised by ticket sales would support the American Committee for Devastated France and the Navy Club. The effective broadcast radius was estimated to be 200 miles, and as many as 70 large sites were set up for public listening, along with many other smaller home setups. Atlantic City and Asbury Park entrepreneurs set up boardwalk listening stations on roller chairs. The Wireless Age article includes dozens of reports of crowds hearing the fight in real time with clarity. So, before turning to our own replay of the bout, narrated by a newsreel reporter since no recording of the radio broadcast exists. I'll close with reading a couple of the opening paragraphs from the Wireless Age account, conveying the excitement of this novel achievement of something we today take for granted, a broadcast of a major sporting event. To listeners breathless with expectation came the words, 7, 8, 9, 10, Carpen G is out, Jack Dempsey is still the world's champion. Thus was the climax reached at 3.34 and 26 seconds o'clock on the afternoon of July 2nd. A multitude, not less than 300,000 persons, tense and eager, were hearing at that instant the voice that sounded loud and clear throughout the Middle Atlantic states. The magic of the radio telephone had accomplished new wonders. A daring idea had become a fact. A triumph. It was more than that. It was history in the making. Radio has had its triumphs, great distances have been spanned in the past, nations and continents have been connected, even has the voice been carried across the sea. But everything in the past record of wonders but adds to the luster of this latest amazing demonstration of broadcasting a voice to the largest audience in history. And to what an audience! The great arena where 90,000 persons gathered to witness the contest held but a fraction of the audience that radio assembled. That famed Jersey City site, the 30 acres, was but a dot in the vast area of 125,000 square miles within which auditors gathered to follow the tide of battle by radio's spoken word. The first million dollar gate in boxing history at Boyle's 30 Acres, Jersey City, New Jersey, July 2nd, 1921. Scheduled for 15 rounds for the heavyweight championship of the world. Champion Jack Dempsey, challenger George Carpentier. Dempsey, the bigger of the two and the heavier. Dempsey, six feet, one inch tall, weighing 188 pounds. Carpentier, 5'11 and a half, weighing 172. 
The attendance was 90,000. And the receipts, $1,789,238. The attendance was the greatest crowd ever assembled for a boxing match and the largest crowd ever assembled in America for any sporting event. Jack Dempsey advancing on George Carpentier, or Carpentier, if you prefer the French pronunciation. This was the first world championship bout ever broadcast over the radio. Major Andrew White was at the microphone. The referee is Harry Ertel. Remarkable close-up films of the battle of the century, pitting the savage fighting tiger Dempsey against the popular European heavyweight champion Carpentier in the greatest international prize fight since the Heenan Sayers affair held way back in 1860. Jack Dempsey, the Manassa Mola, 26 years of age. George Carpentier, 27 years old. Carpentier managed by Francois Descamps. Dempsey managed by Jack Kearns. Carpentier with the stripe down the side of his trunks, now on the left, and Dempsey advancing from the right. Carpentier is dead game. Very good boxer. The solid right hand punch. Dempsey stalking him. Carpentier is the idol of France, known as the Orchid Man. Started fighting in 1907 and has campaigned in every division from flyweight up to heavyweight. That's the end of a good first round. In June of 1913, Carpentier won the European Heavyweight Championship, stopping the Britisher Bombardier Billy Wells in four rounds at Belgium. Fighting his first bout in America on October 12, 1920, he stopped battling Levinsky in four rounds to win the World Light Heavyweight Championship at Jersey City. This one of the classic fights of all time. Since he won the title, Dempsey successfully defended the title twice, knocking out Billy Miskey in three rounds at Benton Harbor, Michigan on September 6, 1920, and KOing Billy Brennan in 12 rounds in New York on December 14, 1920. Dempsey, the bigger, the stronger of the two, the heavier hitter. Carpentier, much faster, a very clever boxer, and a good puncher. This is round two of the scheduled 15 rounder for the heavyweight championship of the world. Again, these wonderful close ups of Carpentier and Dempsey. Dempsey with a familiar bobbing and weaving style. Looking to get in close, Carpentier trying to fight at long range. Carpentier has a bloody nose. He's tough and quick is George Carpentier. Dempsey concentrating on the body. This is round three at Boyle's 30 Acres, Jersey City, New Jersey, July 2nd, 1921, for the heavyweight championship of the world. More than 90,000 on hand for the first million dollar gate in boxing history. Dempsey, according to the record, has had 66 professional fights, scoring 45 knockouts, winning six decisions, drawing in five, winning one on a foul. 
Carpentier has had 93 professional bouts. He scored 44 KOs. He won 30 decisions and drew four times. Dempsey is a great body puncher and infighter. He has a terrific left hand punch. Here he is trying to close in on George Carpentier. Carpentier has a sneaky fast right hand. Dempsey developed naturally as a fighter with no early training in the rudiments of the sport. It was in the mining and construction camps and saloons that he first gained the opportunity to display his prowess with his fists. He started the fight around Colorado in 1914, was known in those days as Kid Blackie. He was rated as just a rough, tough kid. But here he is, the champion of the world, fighting the orchid man of France, George Carpentier. Carpentier always looking for boxing room. Has that good right hand by Carpentier and lefts and rights to the body as he backs Dempsey against the ropes. Dempsey still advancing on George Carpentier. Carpentier fighting back. Harry Ertel, the referee, separates them. Carpentier's face is pretty well battered now. Dempsey is unmarked. That's the end of the third round. This is the fateful fourth round. Carpentier almost went through the ropes trying to get away from Dempsey. Again, he ducks away, does Carpentier. Dempsey is wearing down Carpentier. Dempsey stolidly advancing, ferocious, terribly strong. Carpentier now beginning to show signs of weariness. That terrific body attack by Dempsey is beginning to take effect. Ripping right hands by Carpentier, but Dempsey is not slow. Another ripping right hand raising Dempsey's chin. Dempsey keeps coming on. Carpentier trying to hold Dempsey. And finally they're separated. Carpentier looks weak kneed now. Throwing that right hand punch with everything he's got. Carpentier may be hurt. He's holding on. Again, almost losing his feet as he threw that right hand punch. And again. Carpentier is battered. Dempsey advancing. Carpentier is in trouble. Dempsey still belting away to the stomach.
And down goes Carpentier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He's up just in time. And Dempsey goes after him, and down he is again. Two, three, four, five, six. He's trying to get up. Eight, nine, ten, and out. And Jack Dempsey remains heavyweight champion of the world.